Okay, sorry. Somehow I, uh, somehow I cut that off. <laughs> but they eat them. Uh, or the bad ants try to eat them, and the good ants try to keep uh, their little <laughs> juice factories, smoothie caterpillar smoothie juice factories uh, safe. <laughs> So we've got a bad ant species and the friendly ant species have a competition based um, interaction. We've got the time that the caterpillars of the cyanide bat and blue are uh, dependent upon for eating. And then we've got these ants dependent upon the food that the, the uh, tiny butterfly squeezes out. So essentially, if the time isn't there, then the caterpillars aren't there and then the ants aren't there either. It's a three level uh, trophic cascade that's really interesting. So the indirect effect of the time on the ants is also positive. Pretty, pretty crazy stuff. Um, so we've got mutualistic uh, behavior in that relationship. We see this in a lot of different creatures for sure. Bats, yikes, bats. We've talked about bats last time when we discussed uh, their source as definitive, their uh, guarantee as definitive sources for coronavirus, but we see a lot of different mutualistic uh, environments. Probably the standard or quintessential, most classic environment is between bees and flowers or pollinators, for example. Uh, what do they get out of the interaction? Well, bees get nectar and pollen because they eat the protein-based pollen oftentimes. And of course, plants get uh, pollinization and the ability to form fertilized eggs. And what's really interesting is that they're constantly trying to outcompete each other, even though it seems mutualistic. So here's one of my favorite examples. These are hammer orchids. These things are crazy. They have a highly modified labellum that kind of functions and looks like a female ant, which is hilarious. Um, so that the male ant comes in and he's like, yo, what up girl? And then uh, gets kind of sprung against the face of the uh <laughs> the the stamen there so that he's gonna he's, the the plant's like you about to get some pollen you're gonna get that pollen <laughs> and he gets covered there's other orchids that that force entry and then they have to basically wander around on the inside and they're like oh my god i'm trapped and the only way out is a different way so that they can guarantee pollinization <laughs> within that flower orchids are awesome Probably the most diverse plant family, Orchidaceae. Uh, there's a couple that are up there in close grass, has a gajillion different types of uh, different species of Poaceae family. And then I'm trying to think what the most biodiverse plant family. Oh, Asteraceae. You got sunflowers, the sunflower family, man, especially in our area, we've probably got more species in that family than any other plant. So, this all gets back to our ideas of niches. We've got realized niches uh, and true niches, and we'll look at the two differences here. We've seen, we see these examples of kind of evolution in action where we've got, okay, so true or false, species one is likely a generalist where we've got this wide range of ecological resources used by one species and then a, a small range uh, used by the other doesn't necessarily mean he's a generalist, and we'll look at some, some different examples of this. Remember, just the, the niche, or niche, if you want to sound super elitist scientist, uh, is just that multidimensional habitat, and it's influenced by both living and non-living factors, of course. We see this in tons of different examples. We've seen different evolutionary competition, inter and intraspecific, both within and between different uh, sexes within a particular species. And we see some really neat evolutionary changes in intraspecific individuals. So, for example, species one is not as good at using resources as species two. How would you expect that niche to change? And this is where we see this difference in uh, a, a, a fundamental versus a realized niche. So for example, a realized niche is the area that that particular species uses in reality versus a fundamental niche where they're, they're 
their possible theoretical range could could lie and this all has to do with competition between species so for example you might find these individuals within a particular area but more often than not they're going to use this area um, for food acquisition and so forth just because this area where the ranges overlap also involves competition okay and that's because originally if you have two species in a given area whose niches overlap or are using the same resources, then of course whoever's more effective at exploiting that particular resource will end up having greater or more frequent access to those resources. So this is called competitive exclusion, all right? Basically one species prevents another one from occupying a particular habitat. We've proven this at the microscopic level all the way to the macroscopic level. And this is what we have. We have strong competitors and weak competitors where we have the fundamental niche or in theory an area that you find them. But then you have a true or realized niche be much smaller as a result of this competitive exclusion. And this obviously is all highly theoretical stuff, which is what most of ecology is. Woo woo, get pumped. Luckily, if you luckily in field ecology, we do we do real stuff. So, anyways, um, if you got two different species and there's an area in which their ranges overlap, that competition is involved, that's going to force them or those individuals, one of those particular creatures, to have lower fitness within that particular range. And as a result of that, is going that competitive exclusion is going to usually force. Uh, what's called niche differentiation, where natural selection essentially is trying to minimize competition in that area so that they have their own resources to themselves. All makes sense. Most of community ecology, you guys, I think gets back to a lot of basic stuff that we know to be true that we're all super familiar with. Okay, so niche differentiation, change in species traits can lead to what we call character displacement, and we see this all the way back in our classic example of Galapagos finches, where we see difference in beak sizes so that they can exploit different seeds from different trees in the same area, okay? So, we're going to look at a lot of different things in these communities or these ecological communities, like how many of them of a particular species there are, uh, their interactions, really how do we study community ecology? And when you take ecology lab, you'll get some of this, or at least we try to make an attempt at it, because we look at species abundance and species diversity, and we use diversity indices and so forth. But for now, just an interesting discussion. Getting all the way back to our food webs, what we learn about in like fourth or sixth grade or something like that, right? We have these trophic cascades that are extremely important because if there's any damage to them, then the entire food chain suffers. And a lot of people don't think about these things in the right way. For example, people have a general disliking of sharks, but people don't realize that the secondary predators that prey on um, mollusks, that is a large part of the restaurant industry here in the States, uh, if we eliminate the shark population, like some uh, cultures around the world are doing because of their desire for weird ingredients like shark fin for shark fin soup and so forth, then that can result in this exponential increase in the uh, middle of this trophic cascade. And those secondary predators can drastically increase in number and as a result of that, vastly and drastically affect the overall mollusk po populations around the world. And th we've seen this happen historically for sure. If we knock off a bunch of sharks, then the mollusk population will drastically decrease and that can affect the uh, overall economy of um, shelled creature uh, availability like mollusks and the seafood industry and restaurants in the states in general. You've probably seen this most standard example, which is like that Wolves Change Rivers video. If you get bored, watch it. What's really interesting is they ignore the population of buffalo. And what's even more interesting about it is there's no studies. That there are a few studies in the literature. It's It's highly romanticized. And from a conservative standpoint, probably effectively so. So I don't mind too much. But there's not a lot of hard data to back up that these wolves, um, they were reintroduced in Yellowstone and they started preying 
on the elk population that was over foraging on the uh, brush, which affects the waterway um, health and development and so forth. And so they're making the argument that wolves change rivers. And sure, let's go with that. But it's just another example of the interconnectedness and trophic cascades and hierarchy and, and uh, community ecology in general. Here's a neat one. Here's another really cool example. A uh, study they did in Africa found out essentially if 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 lions are overhunted, then there's a drastic in, increase in um, gastrointestinal parasites in the population of rural African cultures in Central Africa um, because the lions prey upon baboons and particularly focus on those individuals who have um, who are in a weakened state or have weakened immunity and who are well known for transferring um, human endoparasites for the gastrointestinal system. So indirectly, lion population. Uh, once again, a top-down, top-tier predator has an indirect effect on the human population for gastrointestinal parasites because they eat baboons. That's a, I love that example. So we've got ecological disturbance, which is really, really important. And if you ever take uh, field botany or field ecology with me, we'll learn much more detail about... Um, primary and secondary succession, where if we clear a section of forest out of the way, uh, because oftentimes we just think about trophic cascades in terms of like animal centric, but plant communities are also really important. There's this whole succession. Hopefully you are well aware you have pioneering species like weeds and grasses, and then you get some shrubs and some deciduous trees that like disturbed areas and poor soil. And then oftentimes you'll have hardy pines come in. And then after that, you end up with a climax community where these old growth trees like beech and oaks and maples and so forth establish themselves in a particular area. It takes about 150, 200 years to reach a climax community from a completely disturbed site in the southeast U.S., which is really, really crazy. Now, there are some sites like this that were regularly disturbed throughout history. We're talking hundreds, if not thousands of years by humans, like Native Americans, uh, to maintain openness in the undergrowth and so forth, and even prairies. There's only one prairie left in North Carolina, you guys. Really, really crazy how rare those have gotten. So anyways, getting back to how the heck we study this kind of thing, we, we look at uh, abundances and diversities. There are neat little indexes you can look at where essentially you're examining differences in diversity and abundance. And in Ecology Lab, you do it in anything from the soil like we look at soil macroinvertebrates or the little creatures or insects that live in the soil all the way up to um, using bird sightings to try and estimate the bird populations between the urbanized and rural areas of campus. And basically you're looking for maximum biodiversity. And there's lots of different indexes you can use to try and measure this. And we'll talk about these things and we'll do the actual math behind them in ecology together. But maybe you can just look at these two pictures and determine, okay, well, there's how many different species of mushroom? These are chanterelles, these are bullets. Anyways, one, two, three, four different species. And here we've got one, two, three, four different species, but we have more of a wide variety than we do in community B. So there's mathematical ways to measure these. We won't look at them now, okay? Species diversity factors in richness, how many there are, and evenness, how close, uh, basically how biodiverse it is, okay? We won't get into that. And I'm not going to make you guys learn Shannon Diversity Index at the moment. We'll learn it in ecology lecture. But for now, you get an idea of how we measure ecological diversity within a specific region. Usually you mark out a very specific site area and then you uh, see how diverse that area is or that sample you've collected. So just wanted to give you a quick run through of a couple different cool examples of community ecology from high level trophic predators like lions and sharks all the way to tiny little interactions that we see with little itsy bitsy butterflies and um, a really cool example of tetrodotoxin with the uh, with the newts trying to compete 
uh, in an evolutionary arms race with the uh, garter snakes. Really cool examples of how all of these unique forms of competition and species interaction leads to neat evolutionary change. Some practicality when it comes to uh, parasites with Lyme's disease and tick bites. Um, oh, they're really, really cool evolutionary arms race between orchids and their pollinators and some theoretical discussion when it comes to fundamental and realized niches. Yeah, just want to give you a quick little rundown of community ecology for this week. I'll probably open up uh, associated online homework just to give you another review. And that'll be what we cover for now. Fish and wildlife regulations. <laughs> All right, guys. Miss y'all.